I hope you're doing well. Thank you for being here. I'm super happy to participate in this TEDx. I love TEDx. <laughs> and uh, today I wanted to talk to you about uh, creation and emotion. But before starting, I just want to give you a little heads up. I'm going to wink at somebody in the room to change slides. I'm, I'm not hitting on your girlfriend or I don't know. I'm just changing slides. I, I don't want any problems, you know. <laughs> but so let's start right away. Who am I? Because uh, I'm no famous reporter or I don't know. Uh, you know, I'm Louis, simple one. <laughs> so uh, as it was said, uh, I am an AI programmer. I'm I do many, many things. I'm 25 years old now. Uh, I'm a pain neuroscience expert. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I've built two companies. Uh, I'm an inventor. I filed several patents uh, during my life. I'm a philosopher, author. I do many, many things. Uh, I need some change all the time, and I need to move. And uh, well, I'm not here to recite my CV. I think it's a bit boring. Uh, but what I wanted to talk to you about was my life journey that led me to all of those things. Everything started pretty much, well, it started when I was born, but it started uh, five years ago. I woke up in an uh, intensive care unit room uh, after being struck by 15,000 volts, so I was severely burned on half of my body, amputated of both arms. I had died twice, which I found really interesting. Um, I was paralyzed, so I, I was in a bad shape, and uh, I was experimenting bad pains because I had severe burns, uh, phantom limb pain where you can still feel your hands. And uh, people started to ask me if I wanted to do hypnosis. And I was really skeptical, you know. So at the beginning I said, hell no, uh, it's useless. Please come back with another solution. But then it was my only pretty much possibility. So I tried and it worked really well. And it rocked my world because all of my beliefs were down because I was more of a scientific type. And from there, I started to play around with my own mind to explore, to discover what I could do. And I got to a point where uh, I pretty much quit every single medication, walked again. I did many, many things with my memory and the word spread out in the entire clinic where I was. And people started to ask me, do the same for me. Because, you know, in a clinic, we're all popping pills. It, it goes. And everybody wanted to quit. And they were like, oh, do the same for me. But I was self-taught, you know, and it was one thing to play around with my own mind, but with other people's mind, I wasn't really comfortable. So I went back to study while I was at the clinic. So the doctors weren't really happy. I had to escape several times, but no matter. And I studied pretty much everything that I could find. Uh, psychology, philosophy, neuroscience, anatomy, physiology, pathology, everything that I needed to be comfortable to become a therapist. And then I became a therapist and I started to specialize in pain, but I worked also with many, many professionals on diverse problematics. Uh, I found solutions with my patients on anxiety disorders, depression, phobia, addiction, eating disorders. I was pretty much all over the place. And through that experience, I saw something emerge. One very powerful strength for everybody. And there I was, well, using that strength to cure certain problems, but I saw it emerge. And I started to do a theory. I created um, a new approach to mental health. And from there, I automated it uh, with AI, virtual reality, some uh, programming. And that's what led me to be an entrepreneur. And that power that I discovered, well, it was the power of creation. It is our biggest power. And inside of creation, Emotions have a very, very particular role to play. <laughs> and again. But what is creation? No, oh, again. <laughs> if I had to define creation, for me, it's an original and innovative sequential combination of entities, so to engender new entities. So it's a long definition, so pretty much you're putting things together in order to create new ones. And I had to really look for a long time to get to that definition because it's hard to en encapsulate, you know, creation. And so let's take just an example uh, and let's talk about artificial intelligence. It's, in, it's pretty trendy right now and I work in that field. So what you need pretty much for artificial intelligence are three things. Computational power, 
databases, uh, pretty much a lot of data, and efficient algorithm. Those are the three key components. And if we talk about skin cancer detection, where they had wonderful results right now, what they had was a database of high quality images where you have experts that tagged all the data. They had very efficient uh, computer vision algorithm. And they had computational power thanks to uh, graphical processing units. And if you take a subcomponent of that com combination, uh, which is efficient algorithm for computer vision, they're also a combination because they took regular approaches and they combined it with knowledge coming from neuroscience and what we could discover about vision. And so you can see how it is a combination and it is sequential. It means that we put two things together, then we put another one and then we get by trying, failing, doing it again, we get to a real creation. And when I thought of it, since I'm still the scientific type and pragmatic type, I was like, how can we turn that into a calculus, you know, a calculation? And I thought, okay, we need some parameters. We need a certain number of objects, techniques, concepts, since it is a sequence, some steps. But those are only the possibilities that you can have, you know. So you need to be humble. You need a potentiality factor. Not all of them are going to be discoveries. So I'd, I've put one number like that, and I thought, okay, one out of 100,000 will maybe be something small, uh, a small discovery. And then I thought, well, we're humans, so we're not going to find all of them. You know, We need to be a, a little bit humble, even more. So let's just say that out of those one out of 100,000, we're only going to find one out of two. And then we need time factor. So I thought we're very slow. So let's spread those discoveries on 3,000 years because it took us 10,000 years <laughs> to go from the first agricultural revolution to the second one. So I was like, ah, 3,000 years. And let's just say that we need five minor discovery to get to a new one, you know, to have a new building block for our creation process. And so I did the calculations. And I thought, OK, let's go back to the dawn of human creation. And let's just think, how, how many entities would we have? So I, I, I took a number. I, I thought, OK, five. Uh, I don't know why exactly. I'm no paleontologist or whatever, so it was very arbitrary here. And I did the calculations. And we get to 2.5 million possibilities if we do the calculation. And then if we apply all the factors, we get to one major discovery uh, every 1,200 years. And I was like, yeah, but if we have one major discovery, well, we have new entity for our creation process. So I did some projections and just wanted to see how it would accelerate. And I found that in 1,500 years, we go from one major discovery every 1,200 years to one major discovery every three years. But then I thought, no, there's something incredible is going to happen. And this incredible thing is that she wasn't looking. <laughs> we can add a step to creation because we have enough entities. We're not limited. And so it explodes. The number of possibilities and the number of creations explodes and we get to one major discovery every six days, so in less than a week. And so we have an accelerating factor of almost 60,000. We go 60,000 times faster in only 1,500 years. So you get to a revolution. This is the agricultural revolution, internet revolution. And there you're going to stop me. You're going to say, you're way too optimistic. Because if we calculate all of this, you get to 200 billion possibilities. So you're going to tell me we're, we're not going to be able to search that space. And it is true. But you don't take into account one new thing that is also growing exponentially on the side. And that is population. And there is another thing and that we experiment right now. We need a lot of interdisciplinarity now because we got so specialized that we need teams and this other thing well i give it a name because i like it it is the chewing gum rule oh hey my slides are not good god well you can already see 
uh, what I was talking about. You see population growing exponentially, and you can see how revolutions are getting faster and faster and faster and faster. Because in like 10,000 years, going from the first agricultural revolution to the second one, and then in like 100 years, we get the Watt engine up to internet, up to DNA, penicillin, nuclear energy. And actually under that picture, I don't know why it's like that, there is the chewing gum rule. And I really like it because for me, putting two brains together, having a team, it's like putting two chewing gums together. You don't just have a mere juxtaposition of two chewing gums. No, you have a new entity and you can create new stuff that you wouldn't be able to create if you only had two chewing gums put together. You can do double bubbles, you can do inside of my mouth bubbles, uh, bubble inside of a bubble bubble. So you can do crazy things and it's the same for human brains. When you put them together, it's not just one human brain plus one human brain. You get to a new entity where you can create new stuff that have never been created and that would never be possible if you only put two brains together. And then I started to wonder, okay, so we know it's a combination, you know it's a sequential combination and it is exponential, but where does the, the building blocks coming from? So I turned to science, because I really like science, and I took a look at neuroscience of creativity. And I found that in creativity, when you do divergent thinking, so when you really create, there is one set of brain areas that is consistently active. And it's called the default mode network. This network is also uh, associated with uh, autobiographical future planning, so pretty much when you create objectives for yourself, theory of mind as well. So when you create and you, you try to infer what another people, uh, person is thinking. So it's really about creation. And then I started to look, okay, what is it linked to others? And it's linked also to self-referential processes. So everything that concerns you <coughs> and to episodic memory recall. So it's pretty much when you try to remember an episode of your life. And there it struck me, it was actually pretty much, it was very clear, what originality originates from our life story. But that's something you're going to tell me, yeah, okay, we know that. It, it comes from everything that we have learned, we have loved, dreamt, even what hurted us, what we hated. It's normal. But for me, this tells us one important thing, and I just had a little bit more fun with mathematics and I thought of, you know, all those occasions where you're in a meeting and you cannot really be yourself, you know, you're not 100% yourself, you're 80%, there's somebody pissing you off, saying really, well, bullshit, and you're sitting there and you don't say anything, you know, you just wait, you're not being yourself 100%, or sometimes it's also because you're not really comf comfortable, confident to be yourself. But when I did the calculations and I thought, okay, let's leave out 10% of who we are on a five sequence creation with 100 possibilities per step. And what I found was, if you are 100%, you have 1 trillion possibilities. But if you're only 90%, which is already a lot, because I, I don't think a lot of people are 90% themselves, you get to 500 billion, you lose half of the possibilities, just by leaving out 10% of who you are. And it is the same when you work in teams. You know, if you want to enable the chewing gum rule, this wonderful rule, well, you need to give out space for everyone to be himself. So when somebody uh, is talking bullshit, you let him say his bullshit. But then you are being yourself and you're telling him, I'm sorry, but I really think it's not... The don't say bullshit, because the, not that much. Don't be yourself that much. But still, it is very important to be yourself. If you really want to empower this huge power of creation, be yourself 100%. And this is <laughs> what I wanted to tell you. If you really want to empower originality and this creation power, love who you are 100% and love who they are 100%. And this is unconditionally. There, there is no condition to that love. It needs to come from directly from your heart. And then I thought, 
through my practice, I was like, yeah, but emotions play a big role, you know, because emotions, well, it's now well known. It shaped how we perceive the world, how we perceive others, how we perceive ourselves, how we make decisions. And so I started to think, okay, how emotions are going to influence that creation process. And then I was asked to talk about fear. And I was like, yeah, it is a particular emotion that we all live more and more often. And in a very diverse fields of our lives and more and more fear, uh, fields. I mean, you have fear, uh, economic crisis, healthcare, future. Yeah, we have a lot of fear. And I went back studying and I was like, okay, what are the outcomes of fear? And theoretically, you have three outcomes. You have fight, flight, or freeze. So pretty much either you fight, either you <laughs> just run away, or you don't move. But creation through fear, if it goes into one of those three directions, it's not going to be viable, real solutions, really productive ones, you know? Because they'll be imprinted by violence if you really fight, or by immobilism if you freeze, or traditionalism, or conventionalism. But no new ideas will spur and no productive solutions. So you're going to tell me, okay, cool, we have three outcomes and pretty much no viable solutions there. So what do we do with our fear? Well, through my experience, I have a good news. I discovered that there is a fourth one. As you may imagine, I've experienced fear uh, more than once. Uh, fear to never walk again, fear to never be autonomous again, fear of what my life could be. Uh, I, didn't, I, I wasn't afraid of dying since it already had happened twice. Uh, fear of what, pff, how I would create a future for myself. But I decided to not let fear stop me. I, I didn't want to freeze. I didn't want to fight because I'm not the violent type. I didn't want to <coughs> flee either. So I started to look for another solution. And I started to think about that fourth F. And it is facing, facing fear. You know, it is standing at the very border of the bridge, looking down and take that decision. You know, that decision in a split of a second to overcome fear. And when I found that you could face productively your fears, I started to wonder, how? What makes that possible? And then it hit me. It is very simple, actually. It's to have a dream. But not any dream. Because it is a dream that needs to be bigger than yourself. Bigger than your own self-interest. My dream that allowed me to overcome those fears, it wasn't about getting famous, getting rich, or God knows what. That dream was to bring that power that I had found to the world. And to create that therapy to help people. And to create this company to give that power to a maximum number of people all around the world. So that dream was bigger than myself. And so it hit me. If we want to create the new revolution to overcome fear, we need a dream that is bigger than ourselves. And if we do that in teams, which is pretty much necessary right now, we need a common dream. A common dream bigger than the self-interest. And if you have to think and to pretty much remember one thing from everything that I have said, you know, take out the calculations and all those stuff. Remember this, no matter <coughs> the circumstances, love yourself 100%, love others 100%, love diversity, love being, being put back into question, love questioning yourself and your beliefs. Dream bigger, way bigger than yourself and dream for humanity because we need solutions right now, but we need to work together and we need to share a dream, not to share a fight. Thank you very much. Yeah.